I don't know why I'm so anxious. I brought my water bottle because my mouth gets really dry <laughs> when I'm nervous. Ugh. Okay, if I just click. Okay, cool. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think the title of my talk is kind of um, states my manifesto in establishing that looms and a lot of textiles technology as we see it with craft are open hardware, have been open hardware. Um, and that's been a lot, that's been the angle that my research has taken. So to introduce myself a little bit more, um, I go by Chanel or S, either is fine. Um, and I am a, I'm doing my PhD at the University of Colorado Boulder, which I just finished. So, <laughs> Uh, as of like three weeks ago. So, sorry, I had to show that. I, I, it's still fresh. I need to show it off. <laughs> so, that was basically the, that's been my fellowship experience as a trailblazer. Um, it is like, oh, okay, Ashwa, do you want to fund my last year of my PhD? Cool. Um, and so, this talk is going to go into, mostly going to focus on kind of that project that capped it off, but it was intentionally this project that I really tried to capture how I approached uh, textiles crafts and coming from someone with a background in computing technology as I majored in physics as my undergrad um, and concentrated on like computer science and stuff. So you all need some background information. You cannot come to one of my talks or read one of my papers without learning how to weave um, because it's, I mean, it's kind of telling how this knowledge has fallen out of our general vernac vernacular. So what the heck are looms? How does weaving work? Uh, quick tip, if you are wearing jeans, probably most pants, unless you're wearing like sweats or something stretchy is probably woven. So let's take a look at how that works. I just want to say generally preface this with Textiles tools are just, they're such a cool class of technology because they come, they were independently invented by so many communities around the world throughout history. Um, and they let you do these incredibly complex things, even without the mechanized machinery as we see there with the um, famous jacquard loom on the rightmost side. But then you also have on the leftmost, one of the most simple looms, which is literally just a frame stringing up some yarns and you can make incredible tapestries with that. So, um, and just, it's so cool that all of these forms, even the oldest form tapestry looms had to be invented first before everything else could build on them are still in active use. There's no such thing as obsolete. So let's just start with the basics. So again, I said a, the simplest form of a loom is a tapestry or it can be called a frame loom as well. And it's literally, just a rectangle with yarns that are strung up in parallel in one direction. These yarns are called warps. Um, and just for convenience, because I'm going to trim away the sides for uh, simplicity, the, we're going to call this side the front, and uh, we have the back beam. All right, adding on more. So we want to, when we're weaving, we want to weave. Who here has woven before? Okay, great. Yeah, so you're taking yarn. Once you have your warps strung up, and usually you treat them as vertical, then you take your horizontal yarn, the weft, and you go over and under and over and under to create cloth fabric. So you can do this with a needle or your fingers on a tapestry loom. If you want to go faster and make cloth more efficiently, um, you can create these mechanisms called heddles which you could literally use like a loop of different string um, and then put them on sticks and lift up a set of your warps. And we call that set because it can literally be a stick, a shaft. Um, so you will, um, in the world of today, you can find a lot of rigid heddle looms that obey, that are basically doing this. Um, and there are many forms of backstrap looms that pretty much have this raising mechanism. And backstrap just means like 
these yarns have to be kept under tension. So instead of a front beam, what's actually holding that tension in front is your own body weight and they'll string it up to like a tree or a post and lean back. It's really cool. I could talk forever about looms. So this is also my info dump. All right, so to add on one more mechanism, um, we come to a we come to what we call a treadle loom or a shaft loom because they have multiple shafts. So again, we now see two shafts on this loom, and they're each raising different sets of warps with different heddles. Now you can see that treadle, based because of a magical floating uh, thingy there, when you step on that treadle, then both sets of both shafts will rise. Um, if generally these are detachable, you just kind of like tie them onto the treadle or maybe even like insert, uh, like there's like a knot on the end and you just like slot it in. So you can reconfigure this kind of loom by, you know, just attaching or detaching which shafts are in each treadle. So if you know some basic uh, counting, actually, now you have a number of combinations that you can create with your patterns. And in weaving, your patterns, uh, your pattern of overs and unders is what creates different types of fabric. All right, so we needed all that information to understand why we needed the, or why the jacquard loom was then created. Um, so who here has heard uh, that claim that jacquard looms were early computers? Okay, so let's unpack that a bit. Um, <laughs> no, I don't, I don't disagree with it. I'm not gonna be pedantic, but <laughs> it's, unless you know weaving, <laughs> and it, it can be kind of this oversimplistic statement. So the main thing that um, jacquard looms really contributed to our current computers are the punch cards. So instead of shafts that you as a human are manually raising or stepping on something to raise them, now instead what is controlling the, um, what is controlling which yarns are rising up and down um, is a machine that is feeding a car that punch card row by row. And the ones that in the punch card, when there are holes in it, those yarns rise up because there are sticks in a magic uh, vacuum. And you can see here how these binary codes of punched holes enabled punch cards in other computers. And actually, if you uh, look at the writings of Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace, they directly reference jacquard punch cards. It's so cool. OK, so what does this technology look like today? And this is what we work with in our, in the lab I'm part of, the Unstable Design Lab. Um, it is a TC2, it stands for Thread Controller 2, and it's called a digital jacquard loom. So we just unpacked what jacquard loom means. Digital, what that means is basically, this is a different way of taking a punch card. Now, instead of a punch card, we can use a black and white bitmap image. And a bitmap is just a giant digital punch card. Um, what do people use this loom for? Um, these are uh, really cool art artist works that I found on the internet. I will properly uh, I will properly give credit to them um, in the Discord thread. Um, but yeah, people use this for prototyping really cool folding structures. Some of these are e textiles um, or actuated. So, um, you can make really high resolution image based designs. And this is all, again, controlled with a black and white bitmap image. Um, so your, your image, your file, it's called a draft, does not show the yarn colors. You still have control over the raw data and then what yarns you're putting into the machine. And it is a manual loom. There are fully automated looms that will like weave each row for you so you're not like feeding the yarn across. But this one is. And what you do to control it is you load in your file and there's one pedal on the floor next to the loom that you can step on and advance to the next. This is why I had to introduce treadles because they're also pedal based. All right, so with, um, in terms of 
work I've been involved with. Um, in our lab, we do use this to prototype woven e-textiles, and you can see some examples. This was, the top one was done in collaboration with a bioastronautics lab, um, working as a fabric woven, um, um, fabric, like wearable, was it, but heart rate sensor? Anyway, biosensors, I forget what it measured, but um, sensors that you could wear just like a shirt. This is actually meant to be worn on the head. And so really interesting problems of weaving in elastic, but also metal yarns. How do you design things if your yarns are also wires and vice versa? So we've also, some of the work in the lab explores more kind of artistic, conceptual questions like that. And we created this piece called The Fabric That Remembers. My advisor, Laura Devendorf, was the one who did the, the draft design and the weaving on this. And I was part of the, I was the system architecture. So everything that happens off the fabric um, and like, how does it send, how is it going to take that pressure, pressure data, which is each of the pads um, and visualize it. And we created a web app where you can tune into the live data of how people are pressing on it. Um, so that's the interaction part of it. Anyway, so creating these files, uh, creating the files for these weaves is a pretty intense process. But what's funny is you can use a lot of, you can use anything that puts out a bitmap image. So a lot of people actually use Photoshop. Um, and this kind of just, it's so cool how this continues a trend of across a lot of textiles, crafts, people don't think of inventing a technique or a tool as just creating something new. There's this acceptance that probably someone has done this in the past at some point. I might be just the most recent person to write this down. And it creates this lovely term I, I love uh, called unventing. And it's kind of, for me, <laughs> being in an engineering adjacent discipline and always having to come up with something novel it's really comforting and I wish the rest of the world could see technology this way. <laughs> so um, another, I guess like design ethos I want to mention before I go into the actual, what I was building um, is that coupled with this sense of, oh, nothing's new. We can kind of like appropriate and hack stuff into what, it, like just tr try to cobble together whatever we scavenge. Um, there's a very well-established practice of hacking already in weaving. So it's actually a Facebook group called Weaving Hacks. It's like thousands of members and people are just sharing hacks. Like this is the Luminar Lab. Uh, we scavenged uh, empty milk jugs from the cafe downstairs. Um, and that is what we're using to weigh down and keep tension on, on the loom. All right. So the system building in response to all of these factors, what do prototyping tools look like if we learn from craft traditions? And it's prototyping generally, um, but it is, we do need a lot of help when prototyping e-textiles. People haven't really made tools for this as we saw in some of the talks earlier today. So this system, again, building on the TC2 and historical looms existing um, use of pedals. We're going to add more pedals. So I called it the loom pedals. That's what happens when you let me name things. <laughs> All right. So again, as I mentioned, hacking the TC2 is already part of weaving on the TC2. <laughs> um, so I just, I do want to mention that like my hack is not the first hack, but it is one of, probably one of the first ways that someone has tried to hack it through this channel. So, you know, setting up a jacquard loom is a big, huge thing. We have thousands of threads going across. And you know what you have to do? You have to individually thread each of those needles. So um, it takes teams of students. And, you know, it's kind of fun if we get an engineering student who's never done textiles, but they're like, oh, I want to make space suits. And I'm like, all right, we're going to put you to work on the loom. I find it really relaxing. All right, so again, um, just to review, jacquard looms, uh, 
use the punch card, which in our case is a bitmap to read the design. On the TC2, you have a pedal that you step on to advance to the next row. And it, it, the interface we were finding limiting because we had to be a lot more flexible with our prototyping. We couldn't just load in a file, weave it, and then it's like, oh, we got to revise this and then go back to Photoshop, which could take hours to revise your draft. While in weaving, a lot of your prototyping happens at the loom. Like you want to weave a few rows, see how the fabric is turning out, and then change up your design. And that was just not possible with that static file uh, workflow. So we, it turns out we end up reverse engineering some of how the TC2 works. It connects uh, to a local Wi-Fi network on your um, where a computer running the controller software that you load the file into is sending it to a row by row. So with the magic of Wireshark, um, we found out, oh, well, let's hack some code that can format bitmap, a row of bitmap, a row of a bitmap image, a row of ones and zeros the correct way. And we could theoretically send any design that we want generated live row by row. So we ended up using a Raspberry Pi, again, anything that can talk Wi-Fi um, to control it. And it just, the Raspberry Pi also because you need some you need some direct access to pins and blah blah blah. I had a lot of fun designing the circuitry. Um, I was able to. I was like, yes, I got a physics degree and like took all those computer science courses for something. So I wanted to figure out a logic circuit that would enable you to just add an arbitrary number of pedals to um, so that you could chain have multiple functions accessible for telling the machine, you know, oh, I want to change this about my design and stuff. So from the start, modularity and reconfigurability and making this accessible to people or like understandable by someone who is weaving, but maybe not necessarily in electronics or in programming, be able to use this and to see their changes live. All right. <sighs> okay. Um, sorry, I just froze up. All right. So for the actual pedals, they evolved from a hot glue prototype to something I actually learned how to 3D print and design a PCB for. Sorry. Um, and for the software, again, so we're interested in functions that can change your design live. So I actually built upon a different um, project in my lab called AdaCAD, which is free and open source software to, um, yeah, to, to more quickly generate drafts besides um, beyond Photoshop. So it operates on a very parameterized node-based uh, model like Grasshopper, Rhino, um, Max. And um, so we built the draft player on top of it because we were like, yeah, hey, it's, a, it's a track. It's like playing music. And you can, there you can configure what functions. So like, oh, if I step on this pedal, does my whole, like, does, does it flip my whole design or so on? So um, we did actually, I ended up using it. Um, oh, that didn't play. Uh, it's not a touch screen. Uh, just switch it. That's a time lapse of me actually using the interface to weave it. Um, I don't need to play it. For reference, uh, this piece of fabric is the whole thing that I wove, um, and I use it as a blanket in my lab. So you, we demonstrated that you can weave bigger pieces on it, like you can weave a kind of a viable size of file on this. All right. Oh, now, okay, the advanced did play it. That is a, a GoPro mounted on top of the, <laughs> the loom. OK. Meh. All right, so um, I'm going to go really quickly. I'm sorry. I ah. OK. So in this process, we realized a lot of what made pedals and like these foot controls important. Besides just looms, um, we realized we saw a bunch of connections. So again, music, such as DIY music pedals, and I the the components that we use in the pedals actually use the same stomp switches that are common in these DIY circles. Um, and then you start yeah, seeing all these foot-based interfaces everywhere else that they really just free up your hands to do creative work. 
And I think this is a really promising direction for just like creativity interfaces. All right, so this was the fellowship part of it. Oh, again, I'll go fast, so I also don't subject you all to it. Um, because it wasn't just, the fellowship wasn't just funding this project. It was basically funding my last year as a PhD, so thank you, Ashwa, for letting me graduate. Um, but working in this very interdisciplinary space, I'm generally in human-computer interaction, but also not a lot of textiles people are there. You go talk to textiles people, I'm too... Um, I'm not focused on industrializing and automating everything. I want to preserve the craft of it. And they also don't aren't that interested in like hardware and software. So who do I talk to? Where does this go? And that is still a question I'm struggling with. So I can get a whole PhD, but the imposter syndrome is still very strong. I am sorry if anyone is currently working on a PhD that I don't have answers for that. Okay, so. This is something I really struggled with um, in terms of documenting an open hardware project. You also have to, you know, publish. And like I said, it's hard to know where my audience lies. And I, for me, like the open hardware community has been a very interdisciplinary space that is, again, like accepting I don't have to properly right I don't have to conduct a rigorous hundred person user study um, and I can use it myself but again that brings the question like who's my user besides me and the other weavers I talk to and I think that's where that open ethos can really build a community around a project all right so future directions we will um, I'll be presenting more of the weaving side of things at the Digital Weaving Conference. Okay. Uh, so that's in Cleveland. Um, and actually, that will be the first time I take this system and put it on someone else's TC2, which will be real exciting. Um, because while we did end up reverse engineering a lot of these functions, eventually we did end up getting in touch with the loom manufacturers for Tronry Engineering. They're a Norwegian company. Um, and Fortunately, they were not mad. They were intrigued that someone who bought their loom. Okay, so, um, but that's because we're building, because we're building on their closed source control protocol, um, we're trying, I'm trying to figure out how to disentangle that so the rest of the hardware is Oshawa certifiable. All right, and I wanna keep working on this. So again, takeaway message, rooms are open hardware. <laughs> All right, thank you to everyone. You can find different, GitHub information and all.